But when the footage is played back, the eerie shape has vanished. In the days before instantly rewindable TV, this naturally led real viewers to question what they had just seen. Wait a minute! Ah, just before we get started with today's video, it's brought to you by our longtime sponsor friends over at Squarespace. What is Squarespace? You don't need me to tell you this again. You know what Squarespace is. It is the place to build a website. Look, if you've been thinking about building a website, don't put it off any longer. If you've got an idea for, I don't know, a blog, a website full of information, a shop where you want to sell things, it's so easy to get started. Just go over to Squarespace, start up an account, go into their website builder. If you have design skills, as I always say, it's super customizable. You go in and you drag everything to where you want it to go. It's very easy. But also, if you don't have design skills, like your boy, you just go in, you select a beautiful template, you mash the keyboard a little bit with your own, like, put your name there, put a picture there, bada bing, bada boom, and it's done. It's insanely easy. And they have all sorts of extra features. There's a list of extra features. Let me find it because it's too many for my small brain to remember. Member areas, email campaigns, collecting donations, social sharing, which I always feel is like, yeah, obviously Squarespace. Kind of a kind of what it's about really isn't it analytics so you can see what's going on blogging tools uh, look, all of these are just great things to make your website thrive and thrive it shall with squarespace don't delay any further get started with squarespace today and you will get 10 percent off your first purchase of a website or domain by going to squarespace.com forward slash blaze and now today's video hello everybody welcome back to another episode of brain blaze i am your revered leader that's right absolutely correct simon this is a show where we uh well danny writes me a script i've never read it before i'm gonna read it sam afterwards is gonna add in some of the finest vintage memes that you've ever seen today uh banned tv shows the council house ghost uh sounds brilliant i love ghosts I love banned things. I mean, I do like banned things. That's always quite fun. But ghosts, Jesus Christ. By the way, I do another TV uh, another TV show. What are we talking about? That's what we're talking about today. I don't do TV shows. No one put me on TV. Uh, is uh, Decoding the Unknown, where we talk about ghosts and shit. Why they're not real. Uh, check it out. There's a link below. Probably not. I probably forgot about it. So just like YouTube search Decoding the Unknown and it will come up. Let's go. Another wholesome schedule of light entertainment programs on BBC One has just drawn to a shuddering close in 1992. UK viewers have been treated to Noel's house party, The Generation Game, and what appeared to be a special 90-minute live broadcast called Ghost Watch, which dared to investigate and perhaps even debunk alleged paranormal activity. That sounds a whole lot better than, uh, what's that stupid American show? Like Ghost Hunters or something? No. Wait, that's Ghostbusters. That's a TV show. That's a movie. There's something, right, where they go looking for ghosts and they're like, Oh my god, I heard a sound! <laughs> and over like the many seasons, of course, they've not actually found any real ghosts. Because ghosts aren't real. How dare you! By the end of the broadcast, some of the most familiar presenters on television are missing, presumed dead, or possessed by a disturbing demonic force. Oh, this is one of those brilliant things where they blend, like, so, like a, a mockumentary, where it's like half, it's not half real, but it's presented as real even though it's fake. I love it. Tens of thousands of terrified viewers aren't really in the mood to watch Match of the Day afterwards. Nobody had ever seen anything quite like Ghost Watch before, and it wasn't entirely intended as a prank to, to purposefully spook the gullible British public. Yet it ended up becoming one of the most controversial controversial bits of television ever broadcast by the BBC. Wow, you can tell like the UK's boring when this is the most controversial thing that's ever been broadcast by the largest broadcaster. I don't know what to do. Should we go back upstairs Shh. and do Shh. Who would rather pretend that the whole thing had never happened at all? It had originally been pitched as a six-part ghost drama by acclaimed horror writer Stephen Volk, with one of the episodes devoted to a supposed live broadcast of a paranormal investigation. When the BBC insisted that the idea needed to be slimmed down to one 90-minute film broadcast as part of the Screen One Strand, Volk I have no idea what that is. I feel like that's something I should be aware of, but I'm not. Volk had a dramatic rethink and dropped the rest 
of the story so that the whole television film would be presented in the style of a live studio broadcast. And here was the really clever bit. Instead of hiring drama actors to play fictional TV anchors, Volk felt it would add more realism if famous TV personalities fronted the show playing versions of themselves. Well, yeah, of course it's going to make it more realistic because you'll be like, oh yeah, that's actually John from the weather. We've been murdered by a ghost. Oh my God. It's dramatic and real because I'm stupid. I may be an idiot. <laughs> But I'm not stupid. So, the main studio segments of Ghostwatch were presented by legendary Yorkshire bred king of British TV talk shows, Michael Parkinson. TV and radio presenter Mike Smith was also on hand in studio to oversee fictional live calls coming in from viewers. The studio regularly checked in on children's presenter Sarah Green, who had been dispatched to a local council house in London to conduct a live investigation into the alleged resident ghost haunting the troubled family home. And Craig Charles was also out on the ground. Wait, Craig Charles? Like Red Dwarfs kept Craig Charles? Okay, Robot Wars is Craig Charles. Uh, locals in the nearby area, although now more famous as Lister in the classic Red Dwarf. Back then, the former punk poet regularly moonlighted as a television host, and so he perfectly completed the celebrity lineup. In this particular case, it was Craig's role to lark about with the public and treat the whole thing with a bit of comical skepticism. Or as Craig later noted, it was his job to be the knobhead. Hmm. Familiar with that one, Craig. I also love being a knobhead. Now, it has to be noted that Ghost Watch was heavily trailered as a television drama. It appeared on the front cover of Radio Times with incoming feature and interviews with the cast. And on the evening of the broadcast on Halloween at 9.25 p.m., the continuity announcer emphasized that Ghost Watch was a drama before we slipped into proper film-style opening credits, which included the name of the writer. This is one of those things. It's like The War of the Worlds. You must have heard of this, like, um... Back in the day, whoever wrote War of the Worlds, um, not whoever wrote it, there was that famous director whose name just totally escaping me right now. Um, kind of a fat dude. Fuck, what's his name? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But he made this radio version of War of the Worlds, and apparently people heard it on the radio, and they were like, oh my god, aliens are invading! And it turns out, like, that's not true at all. There wasn't a panic. There was nothing like that. It turns out, like, three people called in and were like, is this real? And they were like, it's not real. And that was it. There wasn't any panic. It's just an urban legend. Lies. Oh, lies! And for any latecomers who weren't entirely clued up on what was going on, the remaining 89 minutes of Ghostwatch looked and felt exactly like a genuine live broadcast fronted by familiar and reassuring faces. No more <laughs> including knobhead Craig Charles. No more clues were provided that this was just a pre-recorded work of fiction. And so it was that these viewers, who were perhaps understandably left cowering behind the sofa as the events of Ghostwatch, took a deeply sinister turn. Washing back today, I'm surprised how this actually happens within the first hour. The main core of the story is Sarah Green's live investigation of the haunted house, in which a mother claims that her two young daughters are terrified by regular sightings of a ghoulish figure who lives in a cupboard under the stairs. Harry? You're gonna go to Hogwarts, you're gonna do spells, you get a wand, you get a fucking owl, it'll deliver your mail. Deal with it! You twat! I'm gonna fucking put my deck in the air. You what? I mean, it's pretty smart, like, not letting anything weird happen for an hour because that really lulls people into a fa false sense of security and then you just pow, pow, pow for the last 30 minutes. I think that's the right way to do it. Seems pretty clever. The girls have named the ghost Pipes as he makes his presence known in the house by banging on the water pipes in the middle of the night. Over in the studio, Mike Smith and his team of operators are seen taking telephone calls from members of the public watching the investigation unfold. One caller appears to have some inside knowledge of the history of the house. It used to belong to a notorious child molester in the 1960s who hung himself in the cupboard and then got his face eaten by cats. Holy <laughs> Well, I, I, I guess I mean good. <laughs> in a slightly naughty move, viewers are encouraged to call the show on a telephone number flashing up on the screen, which is a very familiar BBC telephone number used in a variety of other live shows. Any gullible viewers trying to get through on the night were greeted with a recorded message which calmly explained that Ghostwatch was just a pre-recorded drama. The only problem is that nearly 30,000 viewers have tried to get through at the same time. This jammed up the BBC switchboard, meaning that not everyone got to hear the message. I think that just... If you, look, you've already advertised it previously as a drama. You've announced at the beginning that it's a drama. It's about ghosts, so it's obviously not real. I don't think you need your switchboard to remind people that it's like... Yeah, I think you should just have people answer and be like, this 
scary, right? It's so real. Throughout the first hour, Craig Charles is still larking around on the streets and treating the whole thing like a joke, while the increasingly skeptical Michael Parkinson spends time in studio chatting with a fictional paranormal expert called Dr. Lynn Pascoe, who seems convinced that the girls in the haunted house are telling the truth. But then the show begins messing with our minds, as Sarah Green continued to wander aimlessly around the haunted council house, and the more eagle-eyed viewers may have spotted the mysterious eerie shape of a cowed figure in the background, which went undetected by the television crew. This is later brought up in the studio after fictional viewers phone in to alert the team. But when the footage is played back, the eerie shape has vanished. In the days before instantly rewindable TV, this naturally led real viewers to question what they had just seen. Minute. That is so clever. That is really cool. This is a really good idea for a show. The tension is really ramped up during the final third of the film. During the live investigation, we begin to hear guttural voices and loud rattling as Pipes the Ghost comes out to play. One of the young kids emerges from her bedroom with scratches all over her face. Oh my god, this shit is creepy. Pictures start falling off the walls and a sound engineer is seen bleeding on the floor after getting clobbered by flying debris. One of the girls walks into a cupboard under the stairs and begins screaming for help. <laughs> I love this. This is genius. Sarah Green follows her inside but is never seen again and the connection to the studio is lost much to the concern of Mike Smith. He was actually a real-life husband. No, he wasn't. Oh, this is brilliant. This is the... I can't believe I've never heard of this. This is like the best idea for a show ever. I can't believe the BBC just wants to forget this. It's great. Studio's completely dark. It's just, just blackness now. All the, the lights have filled. The, the power's gone off. Finally, the horror seeps into the chaotic studio with the suggestion the Pipes is now in control of the broadcast and coming for the viewers next. The closing shots depict a confused Michael Parkinson stumbling around a dark abandoned studio after everyone else has fled in terror. His parting shot is to mumble a chilling nursery rhyme in a strained voice which is clearly not his own as we hear cats screaming in the background and fade to black. Oh, I, 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 it's just so great. And this is like that Michael Parkinson's doing this. It, this guy who came up with this is a f***ing genius. It's a little surprised that the drama wasn't followed by a calming message from the continuity announcer or a reminder that this was just all a dark fantasy. Instead, a chirpy voice just introduced match of the day as if nothing unusual just happens. Sheffield United beat Chelsea 2-1, by the way. Now, we all know that supposed scandals brewing from a controversial broadcast have a tendency to get overblown, especially if the press are having a quiet news day. Awesome Wells is that's the diary, that's the dude. Awesome Wells, the war of the world, the fat guy. He was fat, right? He's fat in my mind. Uh, radio, 1938 radio adaptation of War of the Worlds was rumored to have brought the US to a standstill as millions of listeners began leaping out of windows in fear of what they perceived was a genuine news item reporting on an imminent alien invasion. It's close to the truth to say that the infamous broadcast generated little more than a confused squawk from a pet budgie in Eureka Springs as barely anybody was even listening in the first place. But the reaction to the Ghost Watch episode was an entirely different kettle of haunted daffodils. For starters, the very fact that up uh, for starters the very fact that up to 30,000 viewers picked up the phone to call into the show indicates that a big chunk of the audience really wasn't sure what was going on some sources claim that the show generated nearly a million complaints but that's probably a mild exaggeration what's the population of the uk then like 50 million people so one in 50 people phoned up with a complaint bullshit However, it certainly generated at least tens of thousands of complaints from furious viewers who felt that, the bo that a bond of trust with the BBC had been abused after what was perceived to be a cruel and distasteful Halloween prank. All right, whoever's complaining about this, you f***ing weak-souled biatches, come on, it's fun! This is the funnest thing I've ever heard! Feel free to go off and die in a ditch somewhere. Young children have been frightened out of their skin after watching their favorite presenter Sarah Green disappear forever into a cupboard haunted by the ghost of a child molester. Well, maybe you shouldn't be letting your, watch, your children watch a program about ghosts then. That sounds like it's on you, parents. Sarah had to appear on a children's TV show a few days later to let young viewers know that she was alive and well and had not been molested by pipes. 
Did she really say that she hasn't been molested? <laughs> this is too good! On a more comical note, a vicar phoned in to complain that whilst he understood the show was staged, he felt that the BBC were accidentally unleashing demonic forces. Alright, that guy needs to get his head checked out. And best of all, an angry wife wrote to the BBC with an invoice for a new pair of jeans. Ah! I'm assuming because she soiled herself in fear. That's on you! That's not on the BBC! If you got so scared you had an accident... I mean, just, just wash your jeans and be done with it. Complain that her husband are quite literally sh pants during the misguided broadcast. <laughs> so husband. Ah. Oh, Jesus Christ. What does not wash out? I've got a kid. They've sh themselves. It washes out fine. What are you talking about? It is shit, Austin. Oh, good. Then it's not just me. Whether the invoice was settled at the license fee payer's expense remains to be unrecorded. Well, of course it was. It's the BBC. It's all funded by the license payers, isn't it? But there was a darker side too. Doctors and consultants from Coventry and Edinburgh reported six official cases of PTSD in young children as a direct result of watching the film. Yeah, that same thing's gonna happen when your kids, like, pop a copy of The Sixth Sense into the VHS player. Because that's what, you know, come on. This is ridiculous. It's just a bit of fun and it's on parents to like not let their kids watch TV that's inappropriate. And a couple of parents in, I mean, to be fair, if this was broadcast before the watershed or whatever, then that's kind of on them. And a couple of parents in Nottingham blamed Ghostwatch for the death of their 18-year-old son, who hanged himself after becoming convinced that the family home was haunted by, I don't want to laugh, that's bad, was haunted by pipes, leaving behind a suicide note referencing the ghosts. Again, this is not the BBC's fault. That's a failure of the mental health system. Like, that guy needs clearly mental health because if you watch a tv show and then you think your house is haunted by something in a tv show and kill yourself again it's not the fault of the tv show in any way at all it's probably worth mentioning that the coroner's report made no mention of ghost watch but it's clear that none of this was good pr for the bbc particularly after a judicial review by the broadcasting standards commission which concluded that the bbc had, to, had a duty to do more than simply hint at the deception it was practicing on the audience you judicial review you Buzz kills. Fucking lame ass bitch. Go off and die in a ditch somewhere. The producers were wheeled out on the viewers' feedback show Bite Back to apologize to the nation, and the BBC immediately snapped a 10 year ban on any repeat showing. Although it was eventually released on DVD by the BFI in 2002, Ghost Watch has still never been shown again in the UK. It should be. It's great. And obviously, nowadays, no one's going to be watching it because they'll be like, who are these people? These presenters that we don't know anymore? And also, why does this look like it was filmed? Because it was old. People would not fall for this these days. Fake news has got way more elaborate. It could be argued that the responsibility for all those traumatized young people lies with the parents who chose to let their kids stay up to watch a spooky broadcast on Halloween night. Yes, obviously. Actually, now I'm thinking about it. Didn't they say that it broadcast at 9.30, which is after the watershed? If it's after 9 o'clock in the UK, or at least when I was a kid, don't know if it's still the same now, if it's after 9 o'clock in the UK, it can be dodgy. So your parents have to check whether it's okay for you to watch. That's the rules this is stupid i like that it's stupid that these people got in trouble over this christ but maybe the producers did cross the line with the lack of further indication after the first minute that ghost watch was fiction and going as far as to use a recognizable bbc telephone number at what appeared to be a genuinely live broadcast it's since been revealed that they actually wanted to go a little further until the bbc controller intervened just days before the broadcast the original plan was not to include a warning at the beginning or use film style opening credits stephen volk even wanted to include a high-pitched warble on the soundtrack that would deliberately spook household pets and create even more tension in the family home Fuck! Stephen Volk, you f genius. I love you, you creative wizard. Now that's really not playing fair. Yeah, it is. It's fine. Perhaps the real issue with Ghostwatch is that it was just way ahead of its time, as it would broadcast years before the advent of found footage films such as Blair Witch and the rise of scripted reality shows in which fact and fantasy are regularly blended. Viewers just weren't quite prepared for this crazy shit, yet felt wrong-footed by the BBC. The corporation would still rather forget that it ever happened just a few years back. The BBC's flagship magazine program, The One Show, began putting together a fun segment to commemorate the 25th anniversary of controversial broadcast but it was swiftly vetoed as soon as management got wind of the idea guys it was 25 years ago a quarter of a century can we not have a laugh about it now it's clearly genius 
At least Michael Parkinson didn't seem too phased by the subsequent scandal. His thoroughly Yorkshire reaction to the press at the time was just to shrug his shoulders and proclaim, Some people are daft. Or Yorkshire. Daft. Some people believe the wrestling. Yeah, Michael Parkinson, I'm f***ing with you, you legend. Uh, this has been an episode of Brain Blaze. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I got some beard oil on my desk from uh, Beard Blaze, so I'll just mention that. There's a link below if you should uh, want to slather this some of, oh, some of this on your face. No ghosts in this. That's a selling point, isn't it? Brilliant. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Now, just before you leave today's video, let me tell you about another channel that I run called Decoding the Unknown. It's a show where I take a deep dive in some of the world's biggest mysteries, from what happened to the Roanoke colonist to the regular guy who found a listening device in one of his power strips. It's always a bit of a wild ride. You can find a link to Decoding the Unknown below, or just search Decoding the Unknown in YouTube, and you will find it. Hey there, demons. It's me, your boy.